And I want to talk today a little bit about um, about an Ethiopian eunuch who meets Philip along the way, along the way. Um, open your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 8, verse 26. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can you can remain sitting. It's going to be a little bit of a long read, so just bear with me for a little bit. And it says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandaki, which means the queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And this is the passage of scripture, the eunuch was reading. Quote, he was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Tell somebody it's good news. Tell somebody, say it's good news. The good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here's water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And verse 37 is absent from the New King James Version, but it's, uh, it's absent from the New International Version, but the New King James Version says, Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw, himself, saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Say rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Amen? Amen? Father, speak to us today. Give us your powerful word and just inspiration, strength, fortification, teaching, correction. All that your word has to offer because your word is life. And we open our hearts to what you have to say to the church. Our ears are attentive. Speak to us today in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Hallelujah. My thing today is along the way. Along the way. Along the way. It's a powerful uh, uh, piece of scripture because the focus of this text is the experience of enlightenment that this Ethiopian eunuch has. 
A powerful moment of revelation that changes his life completely, changes his outlook on things, and brings him to an immediate place of repentance. And it's, it's, it's truly supernatural enlightenment and revelation. And it's so powerful because uh, we, don't, we don't even get this man's name. We just get his, his title. He was... He was an Ethiopian eunuch, and his title was he was he was he was a carer for the treasury of the queen of Ethiopia. And this and this is this isn't Ethiopia geographically as we know it today. It was a place just uh, I guess near where it is today, but a place probably within the borders of southern Egypt. Uh, regardless of where it was, this man wasn't just a nobody. He was an important person. He probably had a committee of people with him. He was important. He was of influence. Uh, and this, this Ethiopian eunuch, he comes to this place of full acknowledgement within himself of the power of the sacrifice of Jesus simply because of Philip's testimony. And it's, to me, a powerful, powerful, powerful experience. Even though it's so briefly described and there, there isn't a whole lot of ramifications from it, the Bible then just drops the story of this man and doesn't tell us any more about him, which, which brings me important information. Even in the lack of information, there is uh, truly information in Scripture for us. It's that the, the whereabouts of this man after this fact is not really what is most important for at least the scriptural narrative. What's most important for us is his experience uh, alone. His experience is the focus of this text. And the text doesn't introduce him to us in any particular way. Doesn't give us his background. We don't know who his parents are. We don't know where he comes from. We don't even know where he is going. Uh, aside from the passage just says that he's coming from Jerusalem to worship. He's going back home. But, but it doesn't give you specifics about what he has done or what, or what he intends to do. And therefore, my focus is brought back to simply his experience. An experience that is powerful, an experience that is transformative, an experience that truly uh, brings him to, uh, to a place of surrender, a powerful experience, an experience of someone who has met Jesus. Now, this is Powerful. I'm so sorry, but I get excited every time I talk about Jesus. I get truly excited. And I wanted to preach this passage today, or rather, I believe the Spirit led me to preach this passage today. Because today we're celebrating new birth. We had a baptism in his first service. We're going to have several other people who are baptizing in the second service. And, and I think it, it's just right for us to talk about a man who met Jesus, decided to be baptized, and had that powerful experience of a turnaround in just, it's so, in such a, a quick interaction with Philip. And it speaks to me about several touches of God in this man's life that happen along the way. Say along the way. Say it again. Say along the way. What's powerful about his experience is that he doesn't necessarily go anywhere in particular in order to experience transformation. And this transformation, by the way, is exactly what we all ought to seek. An experience of enlightenment, an experience of revelation about the person of Jesus Christ. The person of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. If you haven't experienced this level of enlightenment yet, I pray, I pray and I pray that God will reach you along the way. Because it doesn't matter whether or not you, you come to church or you don't, what church you go to or you don't. The fact of the matter is that if your heart is seeking for answers, God will meet you along the way. God will meet you along the way. And this along the way is a, a nebulous place um, in, in uh, uh, an unspecific place and it's a it symbolizes and represents a place in life as this man is journeying through the desert he is just along the way he's neither here nor there he's just on his way to his destination and and this uneventful place apparently this place of undefined location of of of, of unspecific uh, uh, purpose 
purpose, this place of transition and change and, 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 and this, this place of movement in life, it, it, it represents so powerfully how God comes to meet us. He comes to meet us along the way. Say along the way. Along the way. And this symbolizes to me a uh, the powerful experience we can have with God anytime, anywhere, anyhow. Just along the way. And, and it speaks to me about God's reaching power. Come on, somebody. A lot of people think that in order for God to reach you, you have to act a certain way, you have to go to a certain place, you have to listen to a certain type of music, and you have to hear some type of preacher. But I tell you, no! God can reach you anywhere, anytime, anyhow. I have a pastor friend of mine who met Jesus in a very, very unusual circumstance. He was high out of his mind, smoking pot on top of a hill with some friends. And all of a sudden, he was high as a kite. Jesus appeared to him in what seemed to be a psychedelic experience. I don't know what he was mixing in with whatever he was smoking. But he was having a crazy trip. And he saw Jesus. And the way he says it too. He lives in Portugal now, and he's just a powerful man of God. He was, he was wearing shorts, and he describes it as a cool night, a cold night. He had this crazy experience, this crazy vision. He thought he was going crazy, so he came running out down the hill. And the, first, the very first church he saw open, he immediately entered into it. He had a powerful experience with the Lord. That night, he was transformed. God didn't meet him in church. God met him on a hill. I know people who met Jesus, they were in a car or in a club or I, 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 don't, I don't know. I don't know where. I'm not saying you have to go to these places or you have to smoke these things in order to meet God. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is that there's no one specific place you must go. There's not one specific song you must listen to. No, no, no. God will meet you along the way. Along the way, God will meet you. All you have to do is have a desiring heart. There's nothing that you must accomplish or do in order to be deserving of God. None of us deserve Him. All we got to do is desire desire it was all this man did he desired knowledge of God and God met him along the way you know we make it such a big point about our destination you know set goals for 2022 and set goals for for this year and two years and five years and seven years and ten years and however many years you set goals to, set goals for the decade, set goals for the century, set goals for the millennium, set goals to set goals and we're, we're always thinking of the destination and where we're going and where we're going, where we're going. But most of our experiences with God don't happen in destinations. It happens along the way. Along the way. It isn't that what we all experience. You know, and just in this huge journey of life, we are all in different stages of this journey, but all of us are along the way. On our way, on our way to find emotional stability on our way to find financial stability on our way on our way from our teens to our 20s on our way from our 20s to our 30s on our way from 30s to our 40s on our way we're on our way somewhere on our way on our way to 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 you know on our way from 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 having extreme energy to having back pains on our way we're all on our way somewhere 
on our way to learning how to become effective parents, on our way, on our way to now getting used to having an empty nest, on our way, on our, on our way to getting over a divorce, on our way, on our way to reestablishing a family, on our way. We're all on our way somewhere. And you know what? If you, if you are so, so, so focused on where you're going that you miss out what God is doing in your life now, you will miss the point that along the way is the place where God lapidates you, where God molds you, where God where God works within you and, and where God ministers to your heart. And along the way is where we gather all of the know-how and the information and the revelation in order for us to truly experience what God wants from us and in us and what He wants to give to us as we reach the goal of purpose, the purpose of God in our lives. Say along the way, along the way, God meets this man along the way. Why, why are you repeating this so much, Pastor Diego? Because we tend to disqualify ourselves because we are not at a certain specific location in life. We think, oh, God will speak to me once I buy my house. God will speak to me once I have, once, once I have a, a healthy marriage, once I have a, a healthy relationship, once I take care of my dysfunctions, once I, once I listen to worship music for five and a half hours a day, that's when God's going to start speaking to me. Uh, God will start speaking to me when, I, when, I, when I'm able to fast at three days a month or whatever it may be. And we begin to establish these benchmarks. These are important. There are things that we should all strive to do not out of a sense of duty but out of a sense of devotion to our God but what I'm telling you today is that God will meet you along the way he will meet you along the way oh my God this is so powerful I want you to lift your right hand with me and say God meet me along the way and if you're hard truly desires to find God and to see his truth in your life all you gotta do is open your heart and say meet me God I'm not in a perfect place I'm not in an entirely functional place I am not in a perfect family I don't have a perfect marriage I don't live a perfect life I am not living fully in purpose just yet I'm on my way there but God God Almighty Meet me along the way. Oh my God. Meet us along the way. Meet us along the way. I'm not fully, Pastor Diego, free from alcoholism. It doesn't matter. He'll meet you along the way. Pastor Diego, I'm not entirely free. Free from pornography. And my friend, I'll tell you, he will meet you along the way. Pastor Diego, I'm not entirely free. Free from bad, bad friendships. I tell you, he will meet you along the way. He will strengthen you. He will deliver you. He will bring you out. And he will stay you in the, woo, he will plant you in a place that you can be strengthened to live out his purpose in your life he will meet you along the way we make it such a big point about being perfect in order to have an experience with God when truly all of the powerful people we see in scripture who had transformational experiences with God, all of them met God along the way. All of them did. All of them did. And all of them met God along, along the way. My God, along the way. Because God sees potential in you before it's ever realized. You know where God met David? Called him to be king. You know how, Brenda? God met David and called him to be king. Not because he was fighting or he was training battle skills and war strategy. And he was in, 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 in high education of, of political sciences. No, 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 no. God met David along the way. He was taking care of his father's sheep. 
a young boy. God saw in that young boy the potential to slay giants along the way. Good God of mercy. I'm preaching good today. I'm preaching better than you're shouting at me. I'm preaching good today because God has met me along the way. I'm passionate about this because God met me along the way. God met me when my life wasn't perfect, when my thoughts weren't clean, when my the words coming out of my mouth weren't cohesive. He met me along the way and he brought me out. Oh my God. Good God of mercy. He will meet you along the way. Oh, this man's experience is so powerful to me. I couldn't even get to my first point yet. It's so powerful I get carried away talking about it because God will meet you along the way. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You know how, how Samuel met God? Samuel was going to sleep. He was a young boy. He was going to sleep. And God met him along the way. All you got to do is have a desiring heart. You know how God met Saul? Saul of Tarsus. You know, you know the guy we talk about, Paul? Paul the Apostle? Paul the Apostle wasn't always Paul the Apostle. Paul the Apostle was once Saul from Tarsus. A man who opposed the gospel and the disciples of Jesus. And you know where God met him? Not in a synagogue, not in a church, not in a revival, not in a conference, not in a leadership summit. God met Paul on his way to Damascus to do horrible and treacherous things against disciples of Jesus Christ. God met him along the way. The reaching power of Jesus. Let me tell you something. If you have children who are far from the presence of God, I want to tell you something. God will meet them along the way. I want to release a prophetic word right now in Jesus' name. Doesn't matter the level of relationship your kids have with Jesus right now. I tell you, God will meet them along the way. At a certain moment in their lives, when when they think they have it all figured out, at one point or another, there will be a season of enlightenment and revelation where the eyes of their understanding will be open. And I declare, and I release a prophetic word of God over your life today. God will meet them along the way. Along the way. My God. (laughs) Along the way, this man came to powerful revelation. You know, what I see here is, and I'll give you these four movements that I see in this passage very quickly, because my time is pretty much up, but I'll take the next four minutes, one minute per point. How's that? Good? (laughs) Start your clocks, Victoria. What I see is that the main tool that God used to bring this man to a place of enlightenment was the presence of Philip. Now what's interesting about Philip is that Philip wasn't a hyped up individual. He wasn't very important. There weren't a lot of people in Galilee trying to grab a selfie with Philip. Philip wasn't trending and his hashtags weren't going up in popularity. Philip was just a servant serving the Lord that he himself met. And what I find interesting about Philip, actually that clock is wrong. I don't, I don't have four minutes. I still have five and a half minutes. So excuse me. So tell your neighbor, tell him sit tight. Pastor's got five and a half minutes. I can do my four points and I can fit in a joke in five and a half minutes. What are you talking about? Don't mess with me. I got this. I got this, Victoria. Why are you shaking your head, Victoria? I got this. And I see something powerful happening through Philip, through Philip. So this message is not only for those who are meeting God along the way. This message is also for you who claim to know Jesus. Even if you have no particular title, 
The role of Philip applies to all of us. Let's see what happens. First of all, I see that Philip is in touch with the Spirit, in touch with the Holy Spirit. Philip's obedience is striking to me because Philip is in a, in a city called Samaria in the middle of a revival. God, I wish I had the time to kind of break this down to you, but I don't. But what I'll tell you is, go back in Scripture and read what happens after the day of Pentecost. Read Acts chapter 3 through 8, and you'll understand what I'm talking about. Because what happens is, in Acts chapter 2, the Bible says that the disciples of Jesus, they're gathered together in one accord, and then the day of Pentecost happens. And they receive the, the gifts of the Spirit and the fire breaks out. Peter preaches and about 3,000 people come to Jesus in the first sermon. Now that's an effective sermon if I've ever seen one. First sermon he ever preached. 3,000 people got saved. I got to take a few lessons with Mr. Peter over there. 3,000 people are saved and the church now begins to explode. And what happens is persecution breaks out. And some of the disciples scatter from Jerusalem. And there is this place in Samaria where a few disciples of Jesus begin to gather and they face resistance from this man called Simon. And the Bible says that Philip is raised up by God in so much power, bringing the testimony of the gospel of Jesus and, and the sick are being healed and the power of God is manifest. And, and the revival breaks out in Samaria and God rebukes this man called Simon who was a resistance to the church. And revival breaks out and the, the, the city of Samaria is just completely going through a revival. I mean like a, a Holy Ghost party, the kind where people fall out in embarrassing fashion kind of revival. And in the middle of that, in the middle of that uh, awesome occurrence, that's where all the flashes were. That's where the live stream was happening. That's where people were logging in on YouTube and watching the service all the way from, from, from Greece and Jerusalem. They were all tuning in to, to see the, what, what, what was happening in Samaria. God takes Philip away from Samaria to meet one man. One. Say one. And, and by the way, this word... Is, is tricky in Greek because one can mean a, 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 a deeper thing. One in Greek, it means one. One, one man. One, just one single, one unit of a person, of a human. God takes Philip away from a revival to the desert to meet an Ethiopian eunuch. Now, what level of obedience is that? Come on. Imagine you're having a good time with the Lord in a hyped up place. You know, like, I don't know, what's your favorite city? You know, if you're a city person, you probably enjoy like New York or, or some place like that. I, I don't enjoy New York too much. Nothing against it. It's just that they the home of the Yankees, so I don't, you know. Yeah. I can't, you know, <laughs> I know God loves them too, but, you know, <laughs> they're the home of the Jets and the Giants, and like, you can't, you can't, you can't possibly, you can't possibly enjoy New York too much, you know. Regardless of where you love, imagine you take you out of, like, New York downtown, full of people converting and a revival breaking out and brings you to, like, Montana or Wyoming, nothing against them either. It's just Montana, there's not a lot happening in Montana. You know? The, the level of obedience, Philip doesn't even hesitate. Why is it? It's because God takes him out of, out of a revival to start another revival. A revival in the heart of one man. What a powerful thing it is. He was in touch with the Spirit. He was in touch with... With the Spirit. And what I find amazing is that, put the passage of Scripture up for me, please. Uh, uh, verse 26, please. Uh, um, uh, Acts 8, 26. Very quickly. An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, get up and go south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to the desert, Gaza. Now listen to this. The word south in Greek means two things. Two things. 
what's translated as south, go south, can also mean high noon. High noon, like midday. And it's interesting because this phrase seems to be a little bit of a redundance. Because he's saying, go down from Jerusalem to the desert Gaza. Going to Gaza is already going south, going down, south to Gaza. It's all south. So why would he have to say south? This phrase could also be translated, go to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza at high noon. Like midday. That's when the sun is at its highest. So he's going to the desert. In the highest time of day, he is leaving a hub of people who agree with him. And the miracles are happening. And the power of God is happening. And people are being saved. And there's a Holy Ghost party going on. And he's leaving a revival to go to the middle of the desert at noon. For crying out loud. It's a horrible conditions. Horrible working conditions. If there was a disciple of Jesus union someplace, they would be speaking out against these working conditions. <laughs> Obedience. Obedience. Philip was in touch with the Spirit. What does this say, Pastor Diego? It says that we ought to be in touch with the Spirit. Maybe God wants to meet somebody along the way through you. You know what we say? We say, oh, you want to meet Jesus? Come to church on Sunday. What if God doesn't want to meet him in church? What if God wants to meet him along the way? What if God wants to meet him at work? What if God wants to meet him in, in the car? What if God wants to meet him in the Uber? What if, what if God wants to meet him in the restaurant? What if God wants to meet him at school? What if God wants to meet what, what if God wants to meet him walking on the street? What if, what if God wants to meet him in the park? What if God wants to meet him in the laundromat? What if God wants to meet him in uh, Chuck E. Cheese? You shouldn't be going to Chuck E. Cheese unless you're taking my kids with you. <laughs> what, 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 if, what if God wants to meet him somewhere you are? You know what happens when God wants to meet somebody along the way? He brings you to where they are. You know how God meets you? He meets you by coming to you. You know how he comes to you? He brings one of his disciples, somebody that carries his presence. To where you are. So if God wants to meet somebody, all he got to do is bring you there. Hello? I believe that wherever you are, God is. You don't seem to believe that. I don't know why. I don't know what you know that I don't know. But you know something. Are you with me? We ought to be in touch with the Spirit. You know, it's such a coincidence that actually this year we're going to be talking about being led by the Spirit. Uh, big coincidence. We have to be in touch with the Spirit. Understanding that, you, you know, we create a, a little fantasy in our minds, right? That God speaks in a certain way through certain people. The problem with that is God never agreed to that fantasy of yours. And what we don't understand sometimes is that we make church about church. Church isn't about church. Church is about Jesus. It's about your experience with a person. And, a, and the thing is, we are so involved with church that we are no longer able to describe the person that we're here to meet. We're no longer able to talk about our experience with the man, Jesus. 
And that is why we need to be in touch with the Spirit to hear and feel the motion of the Spirit when God wants to touch somebody. There's nothing more important than when God wants to touch somebody else. We must be in touch with the Spirit. And it all happens when, when God speaks to him. And God speaks to him and says, you know, go to the desert. Leave this nice city with the comfortable bed and, and, and plenty of water supply. And go running after a chariot at high noon in the middle of the desert. Now, this might not mean a lot to you, but I went to Doha in Qatar a couple of years ago. And it wasn't even summer. It was their, like, their autumn season. And we went to take a trip in the desert. We took a, a, an ATV, like a four-wheeler, and we went for a trip in the desert. We rented it for three hours. Good Christ Almighty. You have no idea what the desert is. It, I understand now why people die in the desert. I nearly did. Because I got lost from the place to return the ATVs. And we were lost for a good 45 minutes. And I, I was beginning to, you know, to see elves and Santa Claus and stuff. I was beginning to go crazy with the heat. I nearly had a heat stroke. And I was beginning to surrender my spirit. I said, you know what, God, thank you for giving me. You know, the years you've given me so far, and thank you for my kids. And Joshua was unborn. Joshua was still, Jane was pregnant. I was like, oh, God, please, just take care of Joshua. You know, he didn't even have a name yet. God had Philip running along this chariot at noon in the middle of the desert. And I mean running. Look at what it says. Verse, put up for me verse twenty. Twenty-nine, verse twenty-nine. The Spirit told Philip, "Go and join that chariot." Next verse. When Philip ran up to it, the guy didn't even stop the chariot. You know what I'm talking about? The chariot was moving. Philip ran up to it and caught up to it. It was like, "Yeah." So what you reading? Oh, I, I don't understand this passage. Hey, you don't understand it? Oh, well, what are you reading? <laughs> No, he's, he's, he's saying the guy's comfortably inside the chair. You know, he's saying this, this, that, and the other. Who's he talking about? Huh? You know what? I can explain it to you. Do you follow what I'm saying? It takes effort. It takes will. It takes determination. We only want to do the things of God when they fall on our laps. And we don't have to really do anything. When everything is laid out for us and it's all chewed up. No, 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 no. God wants people who have the sensitivity in the spirit to understand when an effort is needed in order to reach somebody who needs an answer. We ought to be in touch with the Spirit. We're very in touch with the Spirit when we're talking about what needs to be fulfilled in our lives. What we want and my promises and my blessing and my faith. What if it's somebody else? Hello, somebody. All right. So I obviously went over time. Brenda wins again. So he was in touch with the Spirit. Secondly, he was in touch with the Gospel. Say in touch with the Spirit. He was in touch with the Gospel. Say in touch with the Gospel. Imagine this. This guy asks a random question and Philip is just able to answer it. Oh, of course, Pastor Diego, he is Philip. No, he just loved the Word of God. He just loved the Word of God. And I'm not saying you have to know everything. What I'm saying is you have to be sure of your experience with Jesus. Be in touch with the gospel and your experience with Jesus. If in order to talk about Jesus, you have to tell somebody to call me, you don't know Jesus. 
I'm serious. If somebody calls you and says, oh, tell me a little bit about Jesus, and you got to say, you know what, I'll text you Pastor Diego's number. You don't know Jesus. You don't. Who's your, who's your best friend? Think of the person. Don't say the name out loud because maybe, maybe somebody else is here who thinks is your best friend and they're not your best friend and that's going to create a whole commotion. It's not a, I'm not ready to manage that level of stress. So, so think, think, <laughs> think of your best friend. Think of that person right now. If I, if I come to you and I ask you, describe to me so-and-so. Describe to me your best friend. What, what are you going to say? Are you going to tell me to call somebody else? No, you're going to be able to describe that person to me. Why? Because you have an experience with that person. You know that person. So if I tell you, tell me a little bit about Jesus, you ought to be able to tell me what Jesus has done for you, in you, through you. You ought to be able to tell me a little bit about what you've been through with Jesus along the years, along, along the time you've been together, along the time you've chatted and what he has told you and how he has transformed you and, and the way he healed you and the way he brought you out and delivered you and the way he rescued you from yourself. Come on, somebody. We got to be in touch with the spirit. We got to be in touch with the gospel. Number three, we got to be in touch with people. The reason why Philip exerted himself so much is because he cared. Oh, that's a big one. I wish I had the time to talk a little bit about caring. Can I tell you something? I am very uneasy about a generation that we're entering into of people who simply don't care about anything. I'm very uneasy about it. I trust God knows best, but me, Diego, not, not the pastor, just, uh, just Diego, just, you know, just the guy, very uneasy. A generation of people who simply don't care. And I've, I really hope that as disciples of Jesus, we can care. Care. Do you know why we inquire about one another? We ask, you know, how are you doing? And the reason why we make ourselves available is because we care. I, I don't, I truly... I personally don't gain anything with you just being here. I don't. I don't. Because, but, but, but I care. Because it's not just about me, it's also about you. I care. You know, when we started this, this first service, you know, in English, because our church is mainly Portuguese speaking. And we started this first service in English. You know, in a, the first week, like the whole church was in the first service. And it was just a wonderful experience. And then the second week, we had like three and a half people. <clears throat> and after like six or seven, eight weeks, you know, somebody came to me in private and said, Pastor, you're getting too too tired. Why don't you stop with this English service? You're just you're too tired. You know what my response was is that I I care I care too much to make an environment where people whose language isn't Portuguese for them to be able to hear what God has to say. I care too much. I know it's it's not ideal. We don't have all of the lights and the and the, all of the the fancy stuff. We don't have all of that. I have, I, what I have to offer is the voice of God that has been speaking to me. And that's, that's what transformed me. So I figure it's good enough to transform you. You know, as God give, grants us 
resources to expand, we will make things more attractive, certainly will, but none of those things to come will ever take away from the power of the word. Let me say something. If the word doesn't touch you, the lights won't. If the word doesn't touch you, the, the music won't. If the word doesn't touch you, an LED panel won't. You know, when I took a trip to Africa in our mission trip to, you know, to, to, to pray over our people and, and, and ordain ministers in Africa, when I came back from there, my vision of the gospel was completely changed because I saw a group of people who were willing to walk on foot for four days to hear the gospel. And I come back to the first world country where if, it, if it's windy, people won't come to church in their all-wheel drive vehicles, sipping on Starbucks coffee. Hallelujah. Do you follow what I'm saying? If the word isn't enough, because <laughs> one day in your life, one day, my God, should I say this? I think I should there will be a time in your life, it might not be now, it might not be tomorrow, but one day all of us go through this season in life where lights will matter not, where LED panels will matter not, where the atmosphere matters not, where everything else fades away. The only thing that remains is the truth of the revelation of the Word of God. It's the only thing that remains. We have to care in touch with people. Last but not least, we ought to be in touch with self. In touch with the spirit, in touch with the gospel, in touch with people, in touch with self. What does that mean, Pastor Diego? It's that man's ability to recognize and say, what stops me from baptizing? I believe what you're saying. What stops me? Philip, let me ask you something. What stops me from surrendering right now? Nothing stops you. Do you believe Jesus is your Savior? He's the Son of God. He died for your sins. Yes, I believe. So yeah, there's, there's a little bit of water right there. Let's go ahead and baptize you, bud. Are you a Patriots fan? Yes, I am. Oh, you're ready. You're ready. Those, those are the requirements to get into heaven. All you got to do is believe Jesus is the Son of God, died for your sins, and will come back again for his church and be a Patriots fan. And salvation. In touch with self. Acknowledging when you need a touch from God. That man's story, just the little narrative, it speaks so loudly to me. Because it's, it's a man who's seeking for a touch from God. He's reading Isaiah, and it's funny because he doesn't even know Stephen exactly what he's reading. You know, he's trying to see the picture with me. And a guy is in a chariot. A committee of people around him because he's an important guy. He's head of the treasury for the queen of Ethiopia. He's a big deal, right? Guy's in a chariot. I don't know what kind of chariot. But he's like a, I don't know, he's an important guy. So picture like a, a, a Land Rover chariot, like a Mercedes chariot, you know? He's in a chariot r reading a book. And he doesn't understand it. The reason why I know he doesn't understand it because when Philip walks by him, he says, do you understand what you're reading? He says, how can I understand if nobody explains it to me? In other words, he's seeking. Say seeking. seeking. Oh, say it again. Say seeking. seeking. And the Bible says, seek and you shall find. Ask and you shall receive. Knock and the door will be opened unto you. He was self-aware. He was in touch with himself, in touch with where he was and the fact that he needed answers 
from above. And all he did was he started to ask them. And when you start to ask questions, God meets you along the way. A lot of religious leaders nowadays don't like people that ask questions. You know why? Because they're afraid you're going to ask a question they're not going to be able to answer. I love questions I'm not able to answer. There are a lot of them, but I love them all. Because it means I, I don't know anything. I've got to continue to search, continue to seek, continue to learn. And what's wonderful about it is that the more you question, the more you open yourself up to a revelation. Are you with me? Stand on your feet. Let's pray together. My prayer for you today is that you may be in touch with the Spirit. That you may be in touch with the Gospel. That you may have a desire, passion for the Word of God. That you may be in touch with people. In other words, you may care like Philip cared. And also that you may be in touch with yourself. And that today, your heart may be open to what God wants to do and say. Amen? Amen. Grab your neighbor by the hand and let's pray together. Father, thank you for this moment in your presence. And I pray that all of us may be in touch with your spirit. Hear the voice of the spirit clearly. God, I pray that we may be in touch with the gospel, in touch with people. And also we may be in touch with ourselves, able to acknowledge when we need a touch from you, able to acknowledge when we need, God, you to speak to us with the words of life and that we are not the source, but you are. And as we come to the source and as we surrender to you, your words of life will fill us with life. Enlightenment, revelation happens not when we are living in a very specific way, but along the way, you meet us wherever we, meet, we may be. I pray for your people right now in Jesus' name, regardless of the walk of life, of their experience and their journey, that you may meet us where they are. Meet every single one of them with the words of life and revelation and enlightenment that they may be made into new creation in you. In Jesus' name. Amen.